Good evening. Welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring women-owned businesses from across the country. And now, for your host, Kimberly McElmore. Hey, good evening and welcome to WSBI, your resource for success podcast program, where you get to meet inspiring entrepreneurs and women owned businesses from across the country. I am your host, Kimberly McLemore, CEO and founder of the Women's Small Business Initiative and an award winning author. Welcome to another night of sharing with us. We have special guest Maureen Metcalf. Maureen Metcalf is the founder, CEO, and board chair of the Innovative Leadership Institute, is a highly sought after expert in anticipating and leveraging future business trends to transform organizations. She has captured her 30 years of experience and success in an award-winning series of books that are used by public, private, and academic organizations to align company-wide strategies, systems, and culture within, with innovative leadership techniques. As a permanent change agent, Ms. Metcalf has set strategic direction and then transformed her client organizations to deliver significant business results, such as increased profitability, cycle time reduction, improved quality, and increased employee effectiveness. She and the Innovative Leadership Institute have developed and certified hundreds of leaders who amplify the organization's impact across the world. The Innovative Leadership Institute has a 20-year track record of delivering value to high-performing clients ranging from local Ohio small businesses to Fortune 15 organizations to the U.S. Armed Forces. Client industry mainstays include technology, engineering, manufacturing, financial, and medical services. The Innovative Leadership Institute also has an inter- international presence helping companies in the United Kingdom and Europe. So without further ado, please help me welcome to my platform, Ms. Marine Metcalf. Good afternoon, or should I say good evening? How are you? (laughs) Good evening. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you so much for coming on to my platform. I am so excited to learn more about you and learn all about the business. And I'm sure the listeners cannot wait to hear more. So, Maureen, why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners just a little bit more about who Maureen Metcalf really is? Oh, goodness. After that long bio, first, Kimberly, thank you for having me on your podcast. And thank you for creating a podcast for successful women and entrepreneurs who are looking at expanding what and how they do their work. You're welcome. Um, and thank you. You're welcome. So about me, you know, every time I'm asked this question, I probably give a different answer. I started my business 20 years ago. Uh, And I did that when I was working for a large consulting firm and my industry was dramatically impacted. So think back to 2001 Mm -hmm. um, around the September time frame and what was happening. Uh, And I think that's relevant now because because a lot of people are being impacted by the COVID pandemic. It it wasn't anticipated. Uh, Many of us see our organizations take a turn. Uh, out of our control, and we have to figure out quickly how to pivot and continue to support ourselves, our families, um, and do meaningful work in our communities. And so that was when I started my business, was a a pivot unexpected, and uh, I started it just as something to do between kind of recovering from an intense consulting career Mm -hmm. and giving me a time to breathe and figure out what next. Um, And I learned that for me, running the the business was what next. It wasn't just a transition. Wow. And it's funny how, like we were talking, you know, you were saying about the pandemic and then of course, 2001, you know, there was another reason for you to have to even go that direction of pivoting that you weren't prepared to do. But it's amazing how We as individuals, when we need to, we get pushed up against the wall. We start doing things and thinking differently than we would have ever even considered doing. And so since we're kind of on that track of talking about 2020, talk a little bit about how 2020 affected you and then how it has affected some of your clientele as well and what you have done for them to help them kind of get out of that rut if they thought they were in a rut. Um, So many of them were in a rut and the rut ranged from... Um, how do I deal with sending part of my team home? So I think everyone had somebody work from home, administrative staff, sales staff, um, front office, back office. 
um, some organizations sent everyone home, mm-hmm. and just navigating. And interestingly, for me as a consultant, I've worked, even when I was employed by a large firm, we were in client offices. So we were rarely sitting in an office that was our company's office. We were always out. So the for me, for over 25 years, I've had the expectation that, that I can work away from the, quote, client, or from my home office, mm-hmm. home company office. It's been interesting to watch leaders who thought that it, no way could their employees work away from the office. They needed to be there. They needed to be interacting. And the longer we were away, the better we got at navigating and creating a new sense of interacting. Mm-hmm. So while probably most of us do not love being on Zoom for eight or 10 hours a day, um, I think most people are finding the path forward to be productive using these tools. And in fact, I recently interviewed someone uh, who has written a book on digital body language and the idea that Many companies will allow some percentage of their workforce to work from home hybrid part-time or full-time. And in that new environment, we just have to hone our ability to work remotely like we did honing our ability to work in offices versus community farms and pre-industrial revolution. We didn't think that we'd send everyone to a building. Mm -hmm. Um, to work during specific hours, people worked at a different cadence. This will again be a different cadence and different skills. It's an evolution of how we work, I think. And so my clients are, are navigating all of the, um, both opportunities and challenges that came with, you know, parents having their kids at home. So how do, how do we navigate the additional stress? Um, we've rethought in many cases, how do we get the work done? We're, we're rethinking what does safety look like? Mm -hmm. And because my focus is leadership, we're really also rethinking how do leaders need to, who do they need to be and how do they need to be? And then what do they need to do to be effective? Because, um, I think people who were successful pre pandemic, Mm-hmm. Some of them are were not as successful during the pandemic. Okay. Yeah, and that and that makes sense. But I guess my concern has always been: why do you feel that um, these the leadership and these organizations had such a huge time just pushing up everything against the wall, saying no, we want everybody in. Um, you know, we want you on site. We want you working here so we can see you. And I always thought that's such an interesting fact because even. For me, because I still work full time, you know, even though I have a business, you know, I always used to hear, well, we got to see what you're doing. Well, you got people who are running around for eight, 10 hour a day, and they're more or less literally running around versus actually getting any work done. What do you think the hesitancy was about all of that? You know, you know my um, employees who were effective working in the office mostly are going to be effective working at home. And now I realize there are preferences, Mm -hmm. but really hardworking, dedicated people will find a way, whether it is their preference or not. And if you need to watch somebody work, either they're not a a dedicated employee who has all the tools they need, Mm -hmm. right? We, We need to account for that. We haven't given, equipped them with skills and tools and those things, but assuming they've got what they need, and you have to sit and watch them, either they're not good or you're not good. And that's a way oversimplifying. I realize that. But the, the folks who I trust on my team, mm-hmm. I rarely see them. And they get phenomenal work done. I don't have to watch them do their jobs. Right. They're good at their jobs without me. That's right. why I hired them. Exactly. <laughs> Keyword. I was just waiting. I was waiting to hear that because I always try <laughs> to grasp that attitude. It's like, well, why did you hire all of us if you're so worried about micromanaging everything that everybody does? You know, there's a reason why these people are in, are in the positions they're in. So what is the huge hesitation about 
whether you're in here on site or you're not on site? I think a lot of leaders discovered during the year, right? It, when we thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, it was a different mindset. Mm -hmm. But over the year, I have heard a lot of leaders say, boy, I didn't think this was going to be a good idea. But many people have worked harder and delivered more um, than we ever thought possible and more than they did in the office. Now, again, there were exceptions to every statement. And I think a lot of leaders have discovered that that view of I need you in front of me mm -hmm. is outdated. Now, there is value in the informal conversations that happen. And I, um, I think much of that we will be able to uh, replace with some um, either hybrid and or what people are doing now with uh, Microsoft Teams and other Slack platforms mm -hmm. that, that they're finding that they can, quote, pop in. It's just electronically rather than in person. And we will develop new habits and new approaches. And the flip to that is, we also now have access to workforce that we didn't have. I may have someone on my team, and in fact I do, have team members from around the world. They're right. not going to relocate to live in Columbus, Ohio. Right. <laughs> exactly. It is the remote capability that mm -hmm. allows me to access mm -hmm. absolute top talent. And for people who also work with um, part-time team members, that wouldn't have been possible if they were required in the office. So that can be anything from um, people taking care of aging parents, people taking care of young kids, mm -hmm. people who are, have physical disabilities. You know, the world has now opened up to expand the potential workforce for people who didn't have access before. Right, so, right. You know, pros and cons to every situation. I think for companies and leaders who are creative, mm -hmm. we're going to find ways around the limitations. And we will offset those by benefits that we didn't have when we had to be full time in person. Right, right. And and then, you know, when you think about having the opportunity to, like I said, to leverage, to bring on people that you wouldn't, it would not have been able to do because it financially wouldn't have been either conducive or necessary because that cost would have been tremendous to get somebody from overseas to move, like you said, to Ohio and then, you know, for whatever amount of time. And then like, so you obviously, uh, you want to have the best, but you also had to think about all those things prior where today we do have that flexibility. And I, and I think that insight is important. So I want to talk, I want to kind of backtrack this a little bit. So I want to talk more about you, Maureen, personally, about how you actually got into what you do. Um, obviously, you, you know, you, you, you didn't have a business, you did work in uh, other businesses prior, but talk a little bit about your journey and what really was the interest of how you enjoy helping others get to where they're at. So, you know, as, especially as a leadership consultant, I should say I had a plan and I followed the plan, but that's really not true. Um, there is a lot of, I think, paying attention to the signs and to our inner guidance. Mm -hmm. um, so I picked a college, you know, at 17, like all kids do or many kids do, uh, based on the boy-girl ratio mm -hmm. um, and based on... Um, and I was going to go into engineering because I thought it was a, a successful path forward for me to make a living. Um, I got to the school I chose. Uh, one of my first classes was economics. Now, I'm a math person. Mm -hmm. So economics made sense to me. We could plot the world by graphs and numbers and equations. And isn't that an attractive way to live life? Um, that, that there's limited <laughs> uncertainty and people are rational. Mm -hmm. um, so I, this seemed like a really good profession for me. Um, so I graduated with an economics degree. I took a job in finance. Um, a few years in, I had changed jobs multiple times. Uh, and I went to a career counselor who said um, finance was not the best path for me. I wanted to go into law or sales, or um, become a therapist. And the career counselor said no to all three of those for various reasons. Um, wow. What she did say was, 
consulting, teaching, or broadcast news. Um, so I ended up consulting, and again, the, this all sounds so rational and logical. The reality was I was in a finance department. One of my old bosses was in town for a visit, and um, all of us went out drinking. And he happened to be in consulting, and he connected me to somebody, and I got a consulting job. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and so, and then um, I left that role, and I was on an airplane sitting next to somebody, and that I got my next job from the guy I was sitting next to on the plane. <laughs> that happened twice. Wow! Right. So, so <laughs> this is um, pre-monster dot com. But but things um, unfolded in, in ways that I couldn't have anticipated mm-hmm. that just worked. Um, and so so consulting, I, I got the first consulting job. I was there for eight years. Uh, second consulting job was the airplane. Third consulting job was the airplane. Um, <laughs> I left um, in 2001. And... You know, I had this question of what next. Mm-hmm. Um, my accountant introduced me to a university professor because I wanted to teach. So remember, consulting, teaching, and broadcast news. Right. Um, so I wanted to teach part time, and I happened to walk into his office, and he said, "You know, it's summertime. I don't want to teach this summer class. Will you teach economics over the summer?" So I got my first teaching job because I walked in when somebody didn't want to do something, and I. I was happy to do it. So, so again, the, the theme kind of if we're paying attention mm-hmm. and if we're willing to take opportunities when they present themselves mm-hmm. and turn the things that seem like a misfortune, right. like the 2011, 2001 Enron collapse, I'm in the utilities industry, mm-hmm. that turned into the opportunity to teach and then I ended up teaching in an MBA program, one of the first online MBA classes probably ever. That was in 2002. Wow. Now we're talking about doing things online, but that was early in that space. Mm-hmm. So I was able to travel as a consultant and teach online. So it, again, things, and I went in to talk to someone at the university and he he basically said, hey, I, uh, somebody wanted me to do this consulting gig and I couldn't do it. Can you? So that was my first consulting project, being self-employed. Mm-hmm. Wow. And like I said, I, I didn't know where I wanted to be. And that project was a, a significant project and really let me both teach and consult and consider that I liked doing the work as a small business, as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. compared to working for a large firm. And I'll also say I couldn't have done this had I not worked for a couple of really good large firms mm-hmm. that trained me well. Right, right. But the thing I love about what you're saying is that you have taken every opportunity that was put in front of you, even if it wasn't aligned originally what you wanted to do. You never really said no. You just said, you know what? Here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it. And it worked. And, you know, even after the counseling session, I'm sure that you, you thought about things. But, you know, a lot of times you hear people say certain things and then you're like, no, nah, I'm going to go this direction anyway. But everything that she told you to do or that you counsel, were counseled on, you have actually done. <laughs> so that's incredible. Let me add the... Go ahead. Oh, so the third one, mm-hmm. consulting, teaching, broadcast news. So I never did end up being a broadcast, a news broadcaster. Okay. But I got approached by a, um online radio station, mm-hmm. and they asked me to do a pilot 12 shows, which I also said yes to, thinking, no one will listen to me. I have nothing to say. <laughs> uh, and who's going to be on my show as a guest? You know, right. my 12 friends? Mm-hmm. Uh, and not that I live in a basement and have no friends, <laughs> but I, I, I was like, yeah, I'll, let me try this for 12. But, mm-hmm. you know, five years later... <laughs> I'm now on NPR, uh, as at least on their podcast, NPR. Right. Um, at, and so here, it's not broadcast news, but it is it's leadership. Mm-hmm, and leadership, yeah. And, and, I, and I just uploaded my, or my publisher uploaded my 10th book to Amazon today. Wow. So Congratulations. It, 
Thank you. And the first, someone asked me to write a column, of all things, a humor column, which is not me. Um, and I got fired from my free writing job. Um, <laughs> so I never imagined writing a book, <laughs> nor did I think 10 books and mm-hmm. all award winning, mm-hmm. international book award winners. So, you know, for people who are saying that's her, not me, mm-hmm. I never imagined any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It just was beyond what I could have envisioned or thought possible with my skills. Right. But it's, it's amazing. Like I said, you know, you, it, in reality, you have pretty much hit everything that like, so you never thought about doing and most people would have never thought about doing, but it is a reality that you can do whatever you set your mind to and just saying yes. And that even if the opportunity only lasted a few months, it was an opportunity, but your opportunities turn into years. And like you said, now here, you've been a part of the podcast show that you never thought was going to be around, but for those 12 people, and then now you are above and beyond that and you focus on innovative leadership. So I want to dive into that. What, tell my listeners what innovative leadership is about. So if you think about leaders you've worked with, or if you are a leader, people come into a company and most of the folks I work with are incredibly dedicated and they work crazy hours. Mm -hmm. So we're already overworked. Uh, We're seeing a rate of change that we've never seen in human history. And most of us secretly wonder how we're ever going to keep up. And, And so leaders often innovate the stuff they do. So if you're in a technology industry, you're just keeping up with technology and trying to, create things that are ahead of your competitors. If you're in medicine, you're trying to uh, keep up with new practices and do research to solve the the biggest uh, challenges in your field. Most leaders, in my experience, are not updating how they think about the role of leadership Mm -hmm. like they think about updating the other parts of their business. Mm -hmm. And so they end up being outdated. So think about if you didn't update your smartphone for three years, it probably right. would just stop working. At least mine seems to stop working at some predetermined <laughs> date. <laughs> yeah, and, I understand what you you're will... saying, right? <laughs> right. And same thing with the software. So the algorithms in old software are just outdated. They don't mm-hmm. do as much. Well, the same is true if our thinking algorithms our mindsets are outdated. Mm -hmm. And so if you are leading people the way you led people in 1985, you are probably doing things that don't make sense. And let me give an example of that. Mm -hmm. In my first leadership role, I was with a consulting firm and um, our accountants were doing audits. So um, contract audits. And my boss, part of my job was to make people sure people were working hard. So if you talked for more than five minutes, I was supposed to tell you to stop talking. Mm -hmm. Now, many of the conversations were about, I'm facing a challenge with this audit. Help me figure it out. They they weren't just talking about sports or something. Um, So I was the time police of all things. Mm -hmm. Now we know that having, if you don't have a best friend at work, according to the Gallup research, you have a chance of being fully engaged of like 8%. So the thing I was doing that back then when, you know, you didn't have personal lives at work, you kept that at home. Mm -hmm. Now we know that, that that approach to leadership was ineffective. And, and, you know, as we learn more about neuroscience and um, how do we build neural pathways and how do people learn and all of this stuff, how we lead continues to evolve who we looked at in the past to be our most effective leaders are often in this current ecosystem, not as effective. They're well-intended, they're ethical, they're all that stuff, Mm -hmm. but the complexity of their thinking may not be the same. Their emotional intelligence may not be the same. I mean, think about command and control with no emotional intelligence during the, the COVID pandemic. Right. Not yeah. helpful. Right. Yep. I, wouldn't be able to survive. I heard, yeah. Yeah. I heard the commandant of the Marine Corps, recently retired commandant, mm-hmm. talk about one of the most important skills 
for Marines during wartime is empathy. Mm-hmm. wasn't what I would have expected. But as we deal with humans in times of difficulty, empathy is one of the most important skills. And yet we have not often built leaders with those emotionally intelligent skills. Mm-hmm. We, we build them with analytically intelligent skills. Right. I agree with that. I definitely agree with that because the world is telling you, you got to be one way when you're a leader and you own something, you know, people look up to you a certain way, but they don't also realize that we want to be, we're human. And so that human humanity, humanity has got to be a part of who your business is because yeah, I, don't, I don't see businesses today, you know, being able to survive in that attitude of awareness of, well, I just don't care. Well, that's not true because you, you have to care because you need people in order to be a successful business. And so, yeah, I, I agree with that, that uh, it's something that in business, you, it consistently needs to change and you have to be aware of those things. So when you are working with um, your clientele in that perspective and you do find somebody who's very difficult like that and, and or, you know, has used to maybe, uh, as a good example, somebody's been in the military for many, many years and their whole persona is just based on, well, you do what I say. How do you get them to change? (laughs) Actually, the military does a brilliant job of getting leaders to develop. Mm -hmm. So I want to just acknowledge that they're not, what we see on TV is not often what what we see in them in person. Mm -hmm. And still the question is, what do we do with people who are stuck in that? command and control, micromanage, I don't trust my people. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are there are a few things. We put them in disorienting situations and push the growth. Mm-hmm. We add coaching to that situation. We send them to training and development. Um, we get them mentors. A, and often that combination of activities works. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is really in many cases... Well, and one of the things I do is assess. So um, I work with a lot of engineers and physicians and super smart people Mm -hmm. back in our analytical bucket. And so back to the idea that we haven't been taught what leadership is in many cases or how we define it now is different. These are people who have the capacity to change. And so it's explaining what it is, giving good examples, helping them recognize um, both their strengths and their deficiencies. And for many of them, you know, if you can make it through med school or law school or mm-hmm. engineering school, you can learn these things. It's just changing myself is different than solving an equation or um, doing a surgery. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it is building those different muscles if they think they, if they think they want to, and and the truth is, not everyone wants to or needs to. They just shouldn't be leading large, complex organizations full of people. Right. They can have strategic roles. They can have subject matter expert roles. They can be brilliant contributors that don't necessarily lead people. Hmm. And that's a good, interesting concept because I have never heard people actually put it, someone put it that way where, you know, they're good at what they do, but they just don't need to be telling people exactly what to be around a lot of people and they can use their expertise in a different way. Cause mm-hmm. you're right that everybody's meant to be a leader, quote unquote. And that doesn't mean that you can't lead and you're not intelligent, but there's just some people who just don't have the tenacity to work with other you know, and human beings per se. So yeah, I, I definitely like that. Um, and how you explain that. And so I do want to dive in a little bit about your books because you just told me a few minutes ago that you just uploaded book number 10. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your book? Um, So this one is Innovative Leadership for Healthcare. And so my COVID project, because we weren't doing as much leadership development as people were trying to navigate um, staying alive in their Mm -hmm. businesses. Um, And... I had the the wonderful opportunity of working with some healthcare workers who uh, were case studies for this book. And so it describes up front, and we partnered with the Uniformed Services University and a couple of folks in their leader development uh, field who also happen to be brilliant um, practitioners of, of medicine and, and um, 
working with people with addiction and neuroscience and so uh, a very robust focus in medicine, healthcare, and leadership. And um, my focus being specifically leadership, but I've also been working with uh, physicians and researchers for about a decade in the healthcare field. So uh, we combined our frameworks. So the beginning of the book gives the, the leadership frameworks. And then the rest of the book, and this is really important to me that we don't just write about what it is that people can memorize. Mm -hmm. We want to create a path for people to become it. So Mm. otherwise we can win trivia tests. We can bore people at cocktail parties talking about leadership. Um, But I'm writing these books to help leaders actually implement different ways of leading, which means they have to change themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to evolve and grow. And so it's a workbook with case studies about um, one is actually a head and neck um, radiation oncologist. So Mm -hmm. a guy working with brain tumors and things. Um, And then the other is a brilliant nurse practitioner um, who's just finished her doctorate. And she is both teaching and working as an NP. Um, so we wanted to get both the nurse and the physician perspective. They're both mid-career. Um, he is a little later than her, but we wanted to get something that was useful for everything from I'm in med school, I'm a resident, I'm a fellow, um, through I'm leading a practice uh, and making it um, accessible and practical. So we do have some theory. Uh, because I think it it needs to be grounded in theory. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to make it useful. So if you run a practice, you can do the, the variation of a book club, and people do the exercises and share them together, and, and they talk about what do we want our leadership culture to be? What systems do we need to put in place to make sure that that culture emerges? How do we recognize, the, what does behaviors look like? Mm-hmm. What, what is the mindset behind those behaviors? And what do we want our our, um, our employees and our clients to experience when they walk through the front door in the morning? Mm-hmm. And how do we make that possible? And it is all about not only what we do, but who we are. Right. Right. So wow. we start with vision and values. Mm-hmm. What do you value? And yep. how do you behave to, to show that? Mm-hmm. Well, that sound, book sounds like it is going to be another award-winning book. <laughs> so you you gotta just, hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just putting it out there for you, Maureen. So I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you what are... I want it to be is incredibly helpful to the people who have worked so incredibly hard Mm -hmm. and sacrificed a lot to show up at work during a pandemic, um, what being afraid every day of exposing their families. Right. Right. And these are folks who were sequestering in their homes or hotels Mm -hmm. so that they could continue to serve patients and didn't often have the support of the the physical contact with their mm-hmm. families. I'm sure they were supported by, mm-hmm. but when you can't hug your kids at night because you've been with patients during the day, and that's that's a tough commitment. Yes, yeah, it is. Like you said, it's one thing to be committed, you know, sitting in front of a computer all day for ten, twelve hours a day, but it's a huge difference when you're not able to be around the people that you love every day because of the commitment that you have made, you know. And for some people, they're saying in the back of their mind, "Well, that's their job." But at the end of the day, you know, they could have lost their life doing their job to make sure that we could live every day. So um, I definitely applaud you um, for that book and looking forward to uh, learning more about it and see if it it does become another award winning book. And so could you tell the listeners where almost all your books can be purchased from? Um, Amazon. So this one is not yet uploaded, but by the time people listen, hopefully it will be. Mm-hmm. So the standard Amazon.com. Um, I think we're on Barnes and Noble and through other booksellers as well. Okay. 
Yeah. So yeah, you have 10 books. So I'm sure that we'll be able to find these. So we won't go through all of them this evening, but I always love talking to other um, um, authors because, you know, having the voice and realizing how important our voice is and sharing the information that we learn with others is an incredible feat to do. And so, you know, once you start writing, like I said, you never wanted to write, but then here you've done more writing than you possibly could have ever imagined. And <laughs> yes, I think, I think all, most of us authors are kind of like that as like, you know, this was not my plan, but now I'm doing it. So it's a, you know, it's a good um, thing to do and it's a blessing for others, you know, to learn from uh, the things that you have researched and uh, the people you're working with and you know, giving them the information they need to have that'll be valuable for them um, in their lives. But I have a couple more questions um, before we end this evening. Mm -hmm. Before, um, I'm sure you get more people who ask you what it's like to be in business. What good advice would you give uh, when it comes to starting a new business? Um, have a good plan. I, I know, I mean, you've heard very clearly from me. I didn't follow my plans necessarily, but you need to make sure you have target customers. You need to know where the money is going to come from. Mm -hmm. You need to have enough financial security. So you may start a company while you're still working. Um, I, I think things always cost more. It takes longer to collect the income. We always hit roadblocks. So make sure you are financially um, stable. It, what's heartbreaking to me is to see people put their houses on the line and lose them mm -hmm. because the market wasn't what we anticipated. Coming out of a pandemic, a lot of us saw it wasn't what we anticipated and it was a lot worse. Um, so make sure you have the financial house in order or do or start while you're working another job. And then the other is know how to sell or have a partner who can sell mm -hmm. or a service that can help you sell. Make sure that you have a pathway to cash. So it's one thing to love what you do. It's another to make a living doing what you do and not be constantly worried about, can I pay the bills this month? And mm -hmm. can I pay the people that work for me? And can I pay myself? Right. Mm -hmm. So I know that sounds a little not inspirational, but the the just the tactical reality of mm -hmm. it is wonderful to be passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the thing you are passionate about before you dive full time into it will also support you. Otherwise you can be passionate and do it part time. Um, I, I interviewed someone recently who donates a lot of money to causes, and he said, uh, and I argued with this initially, he said, I'm not passionate about what I'm in business for, mm -hmm. but the thing I'm passionate about, if I did that, I wouldn't make much money, and I wouldn't make as much impact. I do this other thing that I'm good at, mm -hmm. I make a lot of money, and I donate a lot of money to the things I'm really passionate about. Wow. So I, I like that. that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? It is. It's a great concept. And, and it's a great thought because I was sitting here listening to what you were saying about, you know, it's one thing to love what you do, but if you can't make any money and you don't know how, find that person that you can connect with or be a part of the business that can help you strategize and get that money in. And so you can focus on what you feel you're good on good with. And I, and it, you know, you mm -hmm. don't hear a lot of people say that because, you know, as, as owners, we are also focusing, well, it's mine, you know, it's my baby. This is what I want to do. And this is how I do that. But like I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you're passionate about. If you're just literally just doing this, just to be doing it and you're not making the income, you can't pay your bills and you, you know, it's, it's okay if you're only doing it part-time as long as you are doing exactly what you want to do and it, and it has some feedback, you know, you're getting your return on investment per se. So I definitely like that argument that you had with your guest because, you know, he, he's right to some degree that it's not always about yeah. what, you're, yeah. what you're passionate about, but it is definitely about how you make the income so that you can do those other things to use your passion in a different way if you need to. Very smart. You know, I've watched, I've watched friends and colleagues, brilliant ones, not, mm. not mediocre ones, um, fail at businesses uh, for all kinds of reasons. But the end of the day is 
they lose their houses, they lose their retirement funds. Mm -hmm. And then their, you know, mid to late career with limited resources and fewer options, because you don't recover from this when you're starting from bankrupt at 50. Right. So, so that's the reason I say be clear about the finances and don't put your house on the line. Yeah. If you yeah. can't do it without losing your house, you're in the wrong business. And people may push back on that, but it, well, you, you've been an expert at this family <laughs> counting on you. Exactly, but you know you're expert in your field too. You've been doing this for a long time, so. I wouldn't just be like, oh, she doesn't know what she's saying. <laughs> so you obviously know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, people will make their own decisions and nothing is absolute. Right. But strong, strong recommendation. Don't put your future in. Take calculated risks. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't have said that better myself. And that's why I always have the experts on my show. And But before we go, uh, Marie, could you please tell our listeners how they can reach out to you or learn more about the Innovative Leadership Institute? Sure. So go to our website, InnovativeLeadershipInstitute.com. Um, we do a weekly blog, um, and I bring in experts because I only know so much. And like you, Kimberly, I get to interact with people who are brilliant in their field, and part of what I do is curate that So. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, we also have a newsletter there. And we have a ton of resources for free on the website. My purpose is to help elevate the quality of leaders around the world. And a lot of leaders do brilliant work. They can't afford a coach or they can't take the time to, to get one. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make a lot of resources available so that they can continue to learn and grow and contribute in the ways they find most impactful um, without us charging them. Wow. Yeah, and that's, that is awesome because that's something, you know, that you brought, when you brought that up, I talk about a lot with, uh, with a lot of the clients and people I'm connected to, not everybody who's coming in business can afford every little thing that they're doing. So they feel like sometimes they have to pick and choose so they can be successful. And sometimes it's unfair because when we all get started, we all depend on somebody or something. And so, you know, I'm always try to connect with people who are willing to provide good resources that are valuable and important so that individuals who are aspiring to be an entrepreneur or are already entrepreneurs can still excel without having to go broke. So I really, truly thank you and appreciate that your company and your organization, your business provides that for anyone who's looking to elevate in leadership. So, and, and to do well in their business, regardless what that business may be. So I would thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share what we do with our listeners. And thank you for being such a brilliant host. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, I thank you for coming on tonight with me. Do you have any last words that you would like to share with the listeners? I do. Thank you for asking that. During this time where things are changing so much, we all get opportunities we hadn't anticipated. And like we talked about, step up, step in take the risk, take a calculated risk, but take the risk because each of us has unique skills that the world needs right now. We need people who are compassionate and gifted and talented in their own ways to pull together to navigate the challenges we're facing because people are suffering. And the more we pull together, the better communities we'll have. Absolutely. Yeah, I could, like I said, I couldn't say anything that you said better because that was a phenomenal way to end our show this evening. And, you know, again, I thank you for coming on. And I hope that everyone who is listening tonight is actually learning something. And if you didn't listen to the live, you can always go back and listen to the replay as often as you want. Because I'm telling you, Maureen just dropped some golden major golden nuggets on the show this evening. So please take the time to in, to listen tonight to tonight's show. And of course, it always leads me to ask my listeners, what do you wish you existed for you in 2021 or any 
time. It's time for you to sit back and reevaluate your goals. And if you are ready to have that talk, a real talk, reach out to me at Kimberly, WSBILC at gmail.com. And let's talk about your vision. Let's talk about whether you may want to leave a legacy by writing a book or starting a podcast show where you can share your expertise with many others that, that need that experience that you have and the help. And of course, if you'd like to have more of WSBI, uh, additional podcast show, or do some free virtual live Q&A sessions with some of our favorite entrepreneurs, we are doing a campaign so that we can provide more resources for success. So you're more than welcome to donate to our campaign at www.wsbilc.com. And um, as well, Again, I'd like to thank you all for listening to tonight's show. We'll be back next week with more amazing guests. Be sure to follow us on iHeartRadio or download our mobile app on Google Play or wherever you listen to your podcast. But until then, enjoy the rest of your evening and good night. Good night, everyone. We will be back next Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Follow us on Spreaker, www.spreaker.com slash user slash WSBI. View our new WSBI website anytime at www.wsbillc.com and on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. 